We're going to continue our discussion on the development of the cardiovascular system with a focus now on the great vessels and the conduction tissues of the heart and how they develop. We'll start with looking at the bulbous cortis and in particular the more cephalic region, the truncus arteriosus which is going to septate and divide into the pulmonary artery and the aorta. Here we're looking at a cross section of the thorax where you can see the aorta and the pulmonary artery, the pulmonary artery dividing into its two branches, main branches. And the point I want you to focus on is right here looking at the septum between the aorta and pulmonary artery. Notice the rotation of that septum and notice how the pulmonary artery and the aorta are going to rotate around themselves as you descend caudally through the thorax. So the major point here is number one that this is a spiraling septum and developmentally this septum develops in a spiral fashion. In addition to that, notice that this pulmonary artery is going to be the outflow tract from the right ventricle, which will sit below this area. The left ventricle will be developing in this area, and so this is going to be the interventricular septum. And now you can see how the aortical pulmonary septum is going to contribute to that interventricular septum. So. We can look then at the developing heart and look at this outflow region and then make another point. And that point is that neural crest cells are going to migrate, especially from the third arch. And they're going to migrate from the neural crest region down and contribute to that aortical pulmonary septum as well as contributing to the, some of the blood vessels, uh, some of the great vessels. So when we look at the bulbous cortis and the truncus region, we note that it starts off as a single tube. That single tube is going to then be divided in two by these either truncal or conal swellings, as they're sometimes called, or bulbar swellings. And these swellings are going to be uh, growing towards the midline and be populated by some of these neural crest cells. They will form this aortical pulmonary septum in which the aorta and the pulmonary artery are going to be divided, uh, subdivided from the original uh, truncus arteriosus. In this slide, we're simply making the point that as we look from one to two to three, from cephalic to caudal directions, we can see the spiraling of the aortical pulmonary septum. And so we can come back now to a point we made previously that that spiraling aortical pulmonary septum will intersect the muscular interventricular septum and the endocardial cushion tissue to form the membranous interventricular septum. Now we want to go back and look at the embryonic circulation once again and we're going to talk about the aortic arches first and then we'll come back and talk about the development of the veins. If we talk about the development of the aortic artery, arteries into the great vessels, uh, the major arteries, what we're going to do is use this little schematic. It's not quite right, uh, but it, it'll make the point. And the point is that there are aortic arches that are going to connect the outflow region of the heart with developing dorsal aorta. These aortic arches are numbered one, two, three, four. The fifth one never really appears, that's why we show it in a dotted line, and then a sixth aortic arch. These appear sequentially, 
never all at once but that's how we're going to show them so we can just go through how these different aortic arches contribute to the great vessels the heart would sit down here and the outflow area would empty into the region of the aortic sac so if we look at the aortic arches we can then talk about how they contribute to the great vessels basically the first aortic arch is not going to contribute very much at all in fact most of it degenerates we could talk about a little bit of it remaining in the adult but that's a minor consideration the same thing with the second aortic arch very little contribution there to adult structures maybe a little bit of the hyoid bone uh, artery we're not going to fuss about that the third aortic arch is what we're going to begin talking about and the distal portion of the third aortic arch along with the dorsal aorta cephalically are going to form the internal carotid artery the proximal portion of the third aortic arch plus this little bit of ventral aorta between the third arch and the fourth arch is going to contribute to the right common carotid artery and a new vessel that develops at the junction of the common and distal uh, internal carotid is going to form and that new vessel is going to be the external carotid artery note that this distal ventral aorta is going to degenerate in terms of the fourth arch there are different fates for the different sides on the left side the fourth arch is going to contribute to the arch of the aorta so the aorta is formed by the aorta uh, excuse me the uh, truncus arteriosus and the fourth aortic arch and then a little bit of the descending aorta down to the seventh intersegmental artery the seventh intersegmental artery is going to contribute to the subclavian artery on the right side the fourth aortic arch the descending portion of the right uh, dorsal aorta and the seventh intersegmental artery are going to contribute to the subclavian they're going to make up the subclavian artery which we can see here notice that between the third and fourth arches the dorsal aorta is going to degenerate normally also note that the ventral aorta is going to remain on the right side as it connects the aorta to the subclavian and the car common carotid and that vessel is going to be the brachiocephalic artery so now you can see how the brachiocephalic the left common carotid artery and the subclavian are the major first three major branches off the aorta and you can see where they come from as I said the fifth aortic arch never really appears so it degenerates the sixth arch will contribute to the pulmonary arteries right and left at least the proximal portion the distal portion will have different fates on the right side the distal portion will degenerate along with the rest of the descending aorta on the right on the left side this uh, distal portion of the sixth aortic arch is going to remain and will be the ductus arteriosus and that will remain until birth and will shunt blood from the pulmonary trunk over to the aorta for the fetus now if we turn our attention to the inflow area of the heart we can talk about what happens in terms of the development of the major veins and here what we can go through is the development of the major veins and and what I want you to gain an appreciation for is the the large veins and, and where they come from so we can talk about the fact that there are common cardinal veins 
that empty into the heart, into the sinus venosus, and the common cardinal veins will re receive blood from the anterior cardinal and the posterior cardinal. And that the anterior cardinal vein is going to give rise to the internal jugular. And the subclavian is going to arise as uh, the corresponding uh, intersegmental vein here that will give rise to the subclavian vein. And then a new vessel will give rise to the uh, external jugular vein. So the question is, where do the brachiocephalics come from? And here you can see that the brachiocephalics come from a little bit of this anterior cardinal. It gives rise to the right brachiocephalic. The left brachiocephalic is a new vessel that forms called the thymocothyroid anastomosis of veins. And that will connect the internal jugular, the external jugular, and subclavian on the left over and shunt blood over to the right side. What's going to happen then is that we're going to get a degeneration of the anterior cardinal over on the left. On the right, the anterior cardinal is going to remain and is going to become the superior vena cava. And the posterior cardinal is going to remain and give rise to the azicus vein. And the coronary sinus is going to come from a little bit of that left uh, common cardinal vein. So these are the structures uh, and where they're derived from the great vessels, uh, the great veins. In terms of the inferior vena cava, it's a very complicated picture. And the reason for this is there is a lot of changing in the venous drainage of the body because of number one the development of the liver and number two the development of the kidneys which is quite interesting as the kidneys are very large for a while and will then the de degenerate the uh, mesonephric kidneys and so what we'll end up with is a rerouting of the blood supply here in the abdomen what I would like you to remember is how the inferior vena cava develops. And so the inferior vena cava is going to develop from four different sources. All right, the first source is the subcardinal anastomosis of veins. These are the subcardinal veins, and on the right side, they're going to give rise to what we're going to call the uh, renal portion of the inferior vena cava. So the renal portion of the inferior vena cava is from the uh, right subcardinal vein. The part of the inferior vena cava behind the liver, the hepatic portion of the inferior vena cava, arises from a new vessel that develops behind the liver and connects the subcardinal vein to the right vitellin vein. And so the hepatic portion of the inferior vena cava, which is actually this yellow area here, the line hasn't been completely uh, reached that yellow area, but that yellow uh, hepatic portion of the inferior vena cava then develops from this new vessel. And the rest of the inferior vena cava, uh, approximately, is from the right vitellin vein. There's also a post-renal portion of the inferior vena cava, and that post-renal portion uh, arises from uh, these posterior cardinal anastomoses. All right? Some people would suggest, if you read them, from the sacral cardinal veins. That's another uh, term or some people will call these supracardinal veins. So we have three different ideas about how this portion forms and we can just say that it's the distal supracardinal vein or the posterior cardinal anastomoses that help form 
uh, this distal portion of the inferior vena cava. In addition then, the posterior cardinal anastomosis is also going to give rise to the common iliac vein. Now in terms of the portal vein, here we have the foregut and we're showing the vitellin veins and the umbilical veins and we want to make the point that the portal vein develops from the vitellin veins and you're going to see that these vitellin veins form the anastomoses between each other and that those will come together and form the portal vein. So there's the vitellin veins in green and they will form the portal vein. In orange we're going to have this particular area, the proximal vitellin veins and they're going to form the hepatic veins and in between these cells are going to be broken up, these vitellin vein cells, and give rise to the sinusoids of the liver. The hepatic veins are going to end up connecting with the right vitellin vein to empty into the inferior vena cava, which you see here. In addition, we can talk about the umbilical veins and note that the umbilical vein on the right side is going to degenerate because of the growth of the liver. So we'll just end up with a left umbilical vein and that will continue to the liver and then there will be this new vessel that forms and that's called the ductus venosus. The ductus venosus will form a bypass where his maternal blood can go across the umbilical veins through the ductus venosus bypassing the liver to reach the inferior vena cava. In the afterbirth, the umbilical vein will uh, degenerate as blood from the placenta ceases. It will form the ligamentum teres. And the ductus venosus will cease to be functional and will become the ligamentum venosum. So, we can now talk about what happens as the fetus is born. Fetal circulation, the blood comes from the umbilical veins. It goes through, it's actually just the left umbilical vein after a while. It goes through the ductus venosus to the inferior vena cava. From there, it can go in two different directions. One, that blood can go from the right atrium to the right ventricle, to the pulmonary artery, and then most of that blood will go via the ductus arteriosus to the aorta and out to the systemic circulation. A little bit will go to the pulmonary artery. The other pathway that can be followed is blood from the ductus venosus can go to the inferior vena cava and the right atrium and then as we said in a previous lecture go across foramen ovale to go to the left atrium, the left ventricle, and out the aorta. Now what happens at birth? At birth the umbilical vein is going to cease receiving blood from the placenta. It then is going to close off along with the ductus venosus. In addition to that, we're going to have to have the closure of the fossa ovalis and that occurs as the left atrial pressure increases, supersedes the right atrial pressure, and fossa ovalis is closed off. Finally, as the blood supply now uh, changes and the right uh, blood supply uh, right side of the heart is supplying the lungs now and there's more blood than that needed to go to the lungs the ductus arteriosus is going to have to close off so that we'll end up with blood from the inferior vena cava going to the right atrium to the right ventricle to the pulmonary artery to the lungs to the pulmonary veins left atrium left ventricle and aorta so these four structures in red are all going to have to degenerate so at birth we get closure of the umbilical vein, closure of the ductus venosus, closure of the foramen ovale, and the ductus arteriosus is going to close. And that's going to close as a result of increased partial pressures, oxygen partial pressures. Bradykinins are going to be released from the lungs and that's going to help. And the prostaglandins that are released prior to birth
keep that fetal vasculature dilated and the decline in, in prostaglandins then will also contribute to the closure of the ductus arteriosus. In terms of the conduction system, this has been a rather controversial subject for many, many years, and I'm not sure it's been resolved yet. But it appears as though when we talk about the conduction system of the heart, we're going to talk about three particular areas. This area of tissue between the bulbous and cordis and the ventricle, this bulboventricular tissue, this atrial ventricular tissue, and this sinoatrial tissue. And this is from the initial part of that myocardial mantle that surrounds the heart tube. Turns out there's a second heart field that contributes a lot to the heart cells that make up the other regions of the heart. But this initial myocardium is going to have the ability to rhythmatically contract. So when we look at the SA node, it appears that the SA node developed from cells uh, that where the mesenchyme is going to enter into the region of the sinus venosus. And these cells uh, are positive for TBX18, then TBX3, and they'll activate a group of genes, and some of these genes are connexins, so uh, it, th these cells are very much, uh, have, have a lot of gap junctions. And some of these other genes that all are uh, SA node genes that uh, then arise the cells at this sinoatrial uh, junction. The AV node bundle, uh, the AV nodal cells uh, arise from this AV ring tissue and uh, the AV bundle cells will arise from cells at the crest of that boboventricular loop up here. So remember when we talked about the boboventricular loop, it appears that at the crest of the muscular and the ventricular septum, some of these cells were going to contribute to the AV bundle. The rest of the AV canal cells will become the annulus fibrosis, and this is important because the annulus is going to insulate the atria from the ventricles. Uh, otherwise, you get a, uh, accessory pathways between the atria and the ventricles, and uh, these accessory pathways can lead to arrhythmias. Going back to the AV nodal cells, we can see again the connections are uh, important in the AV nodal cells, and this is a region where the conduction of impulses will slow down as they reach the AV node, and then speed up when they get to the AV bundle. So the mesoderm appears to give rise to cardiac muscle cells and endocardial muscle cells. The neural crest cells develop in the smooth muscle of the outflow tract and cardiac ganglia. So this is again important when we talk about the aortical pulmonary septum. Uh, the proepicardium is connective tissue that will give rise to the epicardium and coronary vessels that will migrate over that myocardial mantle later in development. This uh, set of uh, data uh, is just showing you the embryonic heart rates early in pregnancy and you can see that during pregnancy the heart rate will increase significantly and so this is the mean beats per minute from about 42 to 45 days of gestation to 53 to 56 days showing you that this is a very rapid heartbeat uh, here we're looking at another set of data showing you a similar thing from 6 to 7 to 10 weeks we get an increase in the fetal heart rate. After uh, 10 weeks, much later in pregnancy, the heart rate may actually begin to go down again and that's because the vagus now is going to reach maturity and begin to influence the uh, heart 
in terms of slowing down that heart rate a bit. So the normal fetal heart rate is between 110 and 160 beats per minute throughout pregnancy, but then, as I said, as the vagal innervation matures, that heart rate may slow down a bit.